This video is sponsored by Squarespace. If you need a website, they've got you covered. The Sims 2 is personally my favorite era of the Sims series. Not only is the main title just video game excellence, but one of my favorite spin-offs comes from this era as well. The main game, The Sims 2 on PC and Mac, is one that I hold near and dear to my heart because of its ability to tell a good story. This game doesn't rely solely on the power of our little imaginations to give it substance. It lays out a ton of amazing lore for the player to start with and lets you take that story any direction you may choose. So many iconic characters from the Sims series come from The Sims 2. It's truly an incredible game, still to this day. Now, if you happen to be a Sims fan upon the release of The Sims 2 in 2004, chances are you didn't have a sick-ass gaming PC that you could just load that disc right up into and start controlling little people. A lot of gamers had family computers in 2004, ones that maybe didn't like have excellent specs and couldn't really run The Sims very well. That's why I was a Neopets kid. EA's solution was to make a whole separate version of The Sims 2 to cater to that specific group of players. And they called this series the laptop-friendly The Sims Stories. The Sims Stories refers to three games. The first to come out was The Sims Life Stories in 2007, followed by Pet Stories later that year, and Castaway Stories in early 2008. Life and Pet Stories featured two dedicated story modes, Castaway got one big beefy one, and each game also included a free play mode. None of these games would work with The Sims 2 expansion packs, but they were still really great standalone games. Even though they didn't feature every single little thing from The Sims 2, like they omitted fears, and then the Elder Life stage is just completely gone from The Sims Pet Stories altogether. The thing that makes these games the most unique to me is the inclusion of real-life dedicated story modes. We're used to only seeing that on some of the console versions of The Sims, really. Unfortunately, EA discontinued their sale in 2012, making them abandonware. I highly suggest that you seek out and play these games yourself Self. But if you'd like to just see what kind of wacky, weird shenanigans happens in The Sims stories, I mean, hey, I've got the video for you. This one. It's this one. Life Stories, the more base gamey edition of The Sims Stories. We have two storylines to follow, as well as two neighborhoods. You can jump right into the tutorial Riley's story or a free play version of Riley's neighborhood Four Corners. The other storyline in this game, Vincent's story and his neighborhood Bitville, is yet to be unlocked, but we can do that from progressing in Riley's storyline. Each storyline has 12 chapters to play through in order to complete. I'm not gonna bother running through the tutorials of all these Sims Stories games, as they all play pretty much the exact same as The Sims 2 on PC and Mac. I mean, I'm assuming that we've all simmed here. Riley Harlow has been living in Sim City all her life until she lost her job. Facing eviction, Riley turned to the one person she could count on, her Aunt Sharon. Sharon has always been kind enough to help Riley out in a pinch, so Riley arranged to stay at her aunt's house in the suburb of Four Corners until she was back on her feet. I'm so sorry, sweetheart, but I have to take care of something very urgent at the bank. I should be back before tonight. Remember, the house is yours. All right, free house. Some of our first quests are just very basic simmy type of things like eating, changing our outfit and our appearance. Love the style in The Sims 2, by the way. Ugh, so many cute options. I gave Riley a cute little hairstyle, new life, new cut. Some neighbors came by to welcome Riley to the neighborhood. One of them even gifted her a coffee maker. How sweet. Oh my God, all the sounds and the music. It's just, it's too nostalgic for me. Even the really bad laughing is triggering something inside of my brain. <laughs> Can't help but notice that Riley and Mickey Smith seem to be hitting it off. Well, if I'm being honest, I kind of did that myself. She obviously needs a new man to spice up her new life. I also can't help but notice that Aunt Sharon never came home. <laughs> and the little blurb at the end of the day pointed that out as well. But it's time to stop being a deadbeat moocher. Riley needs to get a job. I picked the first one that came up, a job in the entertainment career track, which she'll start tomorrow. Riley has an urge to check her email, mostly to see if any of her old friends tried to contact her, but the only email was from Aunt Sharon. Riley, I went to help out an old friend. I'll be back in a few days. Make yourself at home. Love, Aunt Sharon. Well, since we have the house all to ourselves, why not invite over our new crush, Mickey Smith. Ugh, 
He brought over one of the other chicks, Agora. At least she brought Riley a gift, you know, a pretty unassuming houseplant. I'm still a little annoyed, but whatever. Nothing's gonna stop Riley from turning this into a date. Her new goal is to hit on Mickey, but we have to increase her romance points with him quite a bit before we can unlock that interaction. Riley's really laying it on thick. Agora did not like that though. She came in and poked Riley for flirting with Mickey. I knew she was weird. I don't care if he was her man first. He obviously is way more interested in Riley. Don't think this is over. You haven't heard the last of me. Yeah, run away, girl. Anyways, I think we've made some good progress with Mickey. Time for him to go home and to take care of Riley's needs. Oh, okay, a fire. <laughs> Thank God I had a fire alarm this time. But I guess that concludes chapter two of Riley's story. The next day, Riley has her first day of work. She's finally a contributing member of society. She still has reservations about this whole Agora problem and decides to talk it over with her new friend, Fiona Fortuna. She has some very interesting information for us. Apparently, an old flame of Riley's from high school, Dylan, moved back to Four Corners two weeks before Riley did. What a strange coincidence. He used to be pretty immature and girl crazy back in the day, but Riley just can't stop thinking about him. Girl, get up. After work the next day, she decides to call up Mickey and ask him out for dinner. Hopefully this will help keep her ex off her mind. They have a lovely little date. They play some chess and canoodle over dinner. God, I miss the good old days when going out to dinner worked. This came out more than 15 years ago and it works better than dine out. God, sorry. You know, I can't resist complaining about The Sims 4. The perfect end to a perfect date night, Riley and Mickey's first kiss. Oh my God, the cutscenes. This was fabulous. Mickey gifted us a rose and Riley went home totally stoked. The next day, Riley was minding her business, working on her creative skill when Dylan decided to give her a call. Hi Riley, I heard from a mutual friend that you were in town. How awesome is that? Say, I'd like to swing by your place around eight and catch up. How about we make it dinner? Is that cool? Is that cool? Ugh. Riley, no! She actually wants to entertain this. Well, I guess she is single, but she doesn't know a damn thing about cooking, obviously, hence the house fire. So we better get her cooking skill up to avoid embarrassment. That night, Dylan was waiting outside. Oh, he greeted her with a kiss. Okay, that's a little forward. Riley enjoyed it so much that she wanted to do it again. I am not technically dating Mickey, she says. She is being pretty scummy though, in my opinion. Anyways, Riley and Dylan have a beautiful spaghetti dinner prepared by yours truly, and he gives her a housewarming gift. That's kind of thoughtful, I guess, but you know, Riley is rightfully confused on how to feel about all this. The next day, Mickey, did you forget about him? Invites Riley out to the park to hang out. Riley beats him there, and while she's contemplating her next move, some lady, Ashley Sinclair, comes up and introduces herself. Oh great, she works at the bank with Dylan, who apparently just won't shut up about Riley. Weird way to put it, girl. I see you. He also apparently speaks highly of my aunt, too. Interesting. I don't know if they know each other or not, but I guess they do. Hey, I don't need this lady here at the park while I'm here with my other man. When Mickey does eventually show up, we grill up some hot dogs and have a really nice time together. Riley says that settles it. Mickey is the guy that I want. He's so nice and sincere and cuddly. I wonder how we'd like a visit from the tickle troll. Okay, I guess we're doing this here and now in public. He liked that, apparently. Enough to ask Riley to be his girlfriend. He gives her a painting and that's the end of their date, but the beginning of their relationship. Everything seems to be going perfect for Miss Riley. The next date she has with Mickey is at the gym. They get their workout on and decompress with some hot tub time, but things can't stay perfect forever. Of course, Dylan shows up. He's really getting in. Oh God, oh God, this is not good for Riley. Ah, oh, fuck. Hey, Riley, I had a great time with you the other night. How about I come over tonight for a second course? Great, now Mickey's pissed off and they're fighting. Fighting over me though, you know, kind of cool. Riley, how could you do this to me? I thought I could trust you. Agora was right, you are a hussy. Oh, wow, I have not heard that word in a long time. Well, I guess things with Mickey are over. Dylan's more than happy 
happy to take me back though. He says my aunt apparently thought that Mickey was no good too. Where is she? Anyways, that was not a good look for Riley. Worst date ever, which is saying something because it was a gym date. Those are not fun. Dylan came over the following day to proclaim his love for Riley. Apparently he hadn't stopped thinking about her since high school. That's kind of sweet. She's, you know, really out of other options too. So maybe this thing with Dylan is worth giving a try. They have a sloppy, wet makeout fest of an evening. Jeez. Get a room. And Dylan takes off under suspicious circumstances. Uh, Riley, I have to get going. I just received a call from work and I need to take care of things. I'll see you soon. Riley's gonna totally ignore all of those red flags. She's totally smitten. She can't help but think about how he's hurt her in the past, however, and how things ended with Mickey. It's just, it's not good. Riley got a call from Fiona informing her that Mickey and Agora are set to be married. And as quick as possible too. Of course it's Agora. Laura, just the cherry on top. Riley's pretty upset, but figures maybe a shopping spree with Dylan can help get her mind off of the impending wedding. Sorry, can't talk. I have to go to, uh, work? That's weird. She could just go by herself, I guess. Retail therapy, am I right, ladies? Do I even have to say women be shopping? No way. The nerve of this guy, Dylan. He's all over Ashley like a cheap suit. Ooh, sick burn, Riley. What's the big idea? And what's so funny? Yeah, don't fuck with me. You have no idea how good you had it with me. You're gonna get it, Riley. You and that whining aunt of yours. Why does he keep mentioning my aunt? I don't even know where she is. Luckily, he dropped his wallet during our little tussles, so I get to buy more clothes. This photo is hilarious. <laughs> Poor Riley. The two-timer got two-timed. Such is life. It is now Riley's mission to win back Mickey, no matter how long it takes. He refuses to come over. Fine, we can just talk on the phone until our friendship is high enough. After a few conversations, he finally agrees to come over. It's gonna take a lot to repair what they had, but after a few days of hanging out, things between them started to pick back up again. Oh my God, a robber. <gasps> I forgot about robbers. Oh shit. I forgot you have to call the police if you don't have a burglar alarm. Damn it. We'll get them next time. As if that wasn't bad enough, the next day, Mickey came over to deliver some bad news. This is so hard for me to do. I'm so happy we were able to patch things up, but I made a promise to Agora. What kind of a man would I be if I broke that promise? To soften the blow, he gave Riley his childhood bear. She's heartbroken, but she knows Agora is not the right woman for Mickey. What could you possibly want, Dylan? Here to kick over my trash? Riley, you and your aunt have cost me everything. Get out of here, both of you. I'm not done with either of you. What is going on? Police, do something about this man playing in my trash. Wait, is that Aunt Sharon? That's him, officer. That's the man that kidnapped me. Whoa, 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 everybody. This is crazy. Oh, Riley, I was so scared. Dylan tricked me into getting a large life insurance policy, then trapped me in his basement. Well, luckily he's getting arrested. That scamming, lying, cheating, two-timing, no good, kidnapper. The officer says, please be careful as he wasn't the only one involved in this scheme. Wait, I need to know more about the scheme. When he kidnapped Aunt Sharon and made her get that life insurance policy, he was trying to force her to make him the beneficiary. She wouldn't, so he set his eyes on Riley. He planned on marrying me and doing away with both of us, cashing out on the life insurance and keeping the money for himself and his accomplice. Could that be Agora? Luckily, Aunt Sharon managed to escape, stealing a really nice TV from him in the process, and went to the police, foiling his plans. Too bad that ugliest woman Dylan was conspiring with isn't here. Sounds like she had a personal vendetta and would get me where it hurt the most. Oh, that ugliest woman? That has to be Agora. And she's marrying Mickey despite Riley. We gotta stop this wedding. But first, time for a new TV. Nice job, Aunt Sharon. Fiona said that the wedding is happening right now. <gasps> We have to hurry. I object. I've always wanted to do that. Riley tells Mickey everything and here comes the waterworks. Agora claims she really did love Mickey and wanted to share the money with him, but he's not buying it. The wedding is off. You, you ruined everything. You bet I did. You kicked her ass and she left the wedding in handcuffs. So now 
what? I mean, the show could go on, and, you know, that's exactly what Mickey's thinking, too. He proposed to Riley, and they got married right then and there. What a happy ending. Riley and Mickey go on their tropical honeymoon and return home to Aunt Sharon's. She decides to give Riley the house and a sexy new bed and walks off into the distance. What a strange woman. Riley's next goal is to get pregnant and start a family, which I, of course, can make happen for them. We convert the second bedroom into a nursery as well. Can't use build mode while completing the story, however, which is interesting. I want to get rid of this ugly wallpaper, but whatever. While we wait on Riley and Mickey's baby, it's business as usual in the household. Mickey's got a job as a party DJ, a fucking course he does and their final goal is to have a baby shower or housewarming this actually took me a couple tries not gonna lie it's very difficult to keep party guests entertained in the sims 2 i had to put in a bar i had to cook meals and then when i finally did have a good party not enough people were there so it didn't count after about six parties i think it was finally good enough to allow riley to give birth right then and there welcome to the world baby that's the end of Riley's scripted storyline, but we can continue to play with her household in Four Corners, just in free play mode. However, we have one more sim life story to get to in this game. We've unlocked Vincent's story. Despite being the wealthy CEO of Gigantor Computing Networks, Vincent Moore has never been lucky in love. While on a business trip to Sim City, Vincent has overseen the finish of JCN's biggest project to date, the SimSat 9000 communication satellite. The launch is flawless, the hands have been shaken, and the bonuses are in the mail. Now Vincent eagerly returns to his modest mansion in Bitville to see his new girlfriend, Samantha Hayden. Samantha told Vincent she had a big surprise waiting for him when he got back. Vincent, it's been three weeks since we started seeing each other. It's time we made it official. I planned our wedding while you were away. I bought a wedding arch with your titanium card. What the hell? Yeah, y this is all moving way too fast for Vincent. They've only just started dating three weeks ago. I think Vincent and Samantha should take a break. She leaves, and by the way, she leaves in the place is a total dump. I was gonna make Vincent clean it all up, but then I realized he's fucking loaded. We'll just hire a maid instead. And we'll be getting rid of that wedding arch too while we're at it. That's more like it. Vincent's buddy Greg arrives. Apparently he was the one who was supposed to be watching the house. Dude, um, back so soon? I was gonna clean up and everything. Sorry about the mess. Some friends Vincent has. Seems like they're all a bunch of freeloaders. He doesn't have an answer, really, about Samantha's wedding arch scheme either. He just kind of let all that happen. At least he gave me a new computer. Don't ask about your old computer. Vincent really needs new people in his life. Well, now that Samantha's out of the picture, what kind of shenanigans will Vincent get up to? The next day, Greg invites him down to the bowling alley to help get his mind off of everything and brings another friend, Sherman, along. Dude, it's so good you made it out. What, with yesterday being so crazy and everything? I don't really want to talk about that right now, Greg. I thought I liked Samantha, but I didn't think she tried to pressure me into marriage after three weeks. What in the hell is Sherman talking about? He's like a troll under the bridge with all this riddle speak. Greg thinks that Samantha was just after Vincent's simoleons. He also thinks the barista is a total cutie and that Vincent should go over and try to talk to her. I'll take a coffee and, oh, how embarrassing. I lost my number. Can I have yours? I'm embarrassed to say that that would probably work on me. The barista Naomi thought it was pretty cringe, but cute enough for it to work. See, I'm loving how fluid this conversation is. It really is this easy to give the game just a little bit more life. I'm looking at you, Sims 4. Naomi leaves, and Greg tries to take her number off of Vincent's hands. Fat chance, buddy. Vincent's on the prowl now. Great. Samantha's here. With Vincent's buddy, Johnny Cullen, too. And business competitor. Vincent will show her. He's gonna flirt with some ladies to get back at Samantha. It's, um... It's not going so great. Oh, she's laughing at me. That was pathetic. You're really taking this hard, aren't you? Johnny says, later, chump. Ugh, maybe Vincent's got to work on his game a little bit. Greg signed him up for an e-dating service, though. You know, maybe he is a good friend, after all. Helping Vincent get back on the saddle. Vincent ordered a pool table, the perfect item to turn this mansion into an epic 
bachelor pad. Single man in his 30s vibe. Time to ask Naomi on their very first date. We'll have them hit the park and see where it goes. They spend some time getting to know each other, play a little game, and it's going really well until Samantha shows up. Of course she does. Who is she talking to? And why is this mystery lady handing Vincent a gift? It was great seeing you last night, Vinny. I got you a tiki torch to make next time even hotter. You have my number if you want to party again. See you later, playboy? Oh no, it was a setup. Now Naomi thinks Vincent's a dirty little player. He didn't even have a chance to defend himself. Life goes on though. Vincent still has to go to work. It's sad. Whenever he calls up Naomi, she doesn't answer. Maybe she's ignoring him. I don't blame you, girl. He goes to try her email, but sees that a message had rolled through from the online dating app from a girl named Sasha. You know what? This could be good. Perhaps it's not meant to be with Naomi. Oh, this chick is forward. Oh, she just wants to try on clothes. Mmm, I see what's going on here. She likes a man with money. Hey, nothing wrong with that, but Vincent's not her guy. Luckily, there's an old golfing buddy of Vincent's here at the moment. He thinks they would probably get along a little bit better. Vincent cuts loose and heads home. Bummer. The next day, another online match calls Vincent up and invites him out to Don Calamari's, one of Vincent's favorite restaurants. What did you say your name was? I'm Alexa. Alexa Star. Great, my name is Vincent Mo- Hello? <gasps> she hangs up. How rude. When they meet in person, she still wasn't even interested in his name, just the coffee. Well, we'll keep trying. Maybe there's some sort of connection here that can form somehow, miraculously. Now, what would Samantha be doing in the kitchen? She's a little troublemaker. Oh, drugging the food. Alexa, Alexa, are you okay? What happened? Did I just fall asleep in my food? I'm so embarrassed I'm leaving. Another date ruined by Samantha. Are we kidding? Greg's convinced Vincent to throw a party at his house. Greg also managed to convince Naomi to give Vincent another chance. The catch is that I have to invite Alexa so Greg can creep on her. It's cool, everyone's having a good time, swimming in the pool, and Samantha decides to come crash the party. She's messing with my stereo. Aw, oh, man, it's broken. Vincent electrocuted himself trying to fix it. This is not good. Greg says he saw Samantha do it, and now the dots are connecting for Vincent. He's permafried now, too. Fabulous. He at least hit it off a little bit with Naomi before the party ended, so that's a plus. Sherman calls and gives Vincent a heads up that Samantha and Johnny are planning on getting married. Why would she care about what Vincent's doing then? Like, go be with your man. Vincent's ready to move on. He'd like to ask Naomi out on another date. We'll see if Samantha tries to involve herself with this one. Remember the first time we met? I think I owe you a cup of coffee. You sure do. That reminds me, did you ever find your lost phone number? <laughs> I like Naomi. I think Vincent should end up with her. This date went amazing too. These lovebirds even kissed for the first time tonight. Before our date ended, Naomi gifted Vincent a new stereo to replace his broken one. She's just so thoughtful. And Vincent's still electrocuted. Damn. He would like to hang out with Naomi again, but instead of going out, she'd like a home-cooked meal. Some spaghetti and meatballs. And electricity. I mean, sparks sure are flying. I love that Sherman always has the hot goss. A little convoluted, but good information nonetheless. It's official. Samantha and Johnny are getting married. This is kind of concerning to Vincent. Is she just trying to get back at him? And why his biggest business companion competitor of all people. Personally, I think this is a terrible idea, but he decides to invite her over to talk things through. Samantha, congratulations on your engagement. I hope you and Johnny work out. I just want to make sure that this isn't something you're trying to do to hurt me. You think you can just brush me off to go for the poor barista? You're clueless. Ooh, it's heating up now. Samantha, I've tried being nice to you, but I'm not gonna let you talk about Naomi that way. I think you should leave now. Good for you, Vincent. Stand up for yourself. <gasps> She's mad. No one treats Samantha Hayden this way and gets away with it. Hey, not the stereo. Again, really? Why are you obsessed with stereo? Samantha, please, can we just wash our hands of each other and be done with this? Oh, you want to wash your hands of me? Do you? Wash this. Jesus, lady, get a grip. It's not that serious. Samantha, what's wrong with you? Get out of my house now or I'm calling the police. If you want to bring the heat, I brought some matches. Holy shit. That was kind of sick as fuck. Damn. What a walkout. A few days later, Greg came by the house. Dude, did you hear about Samantha and Johnny's honeymoon? No, nor do I care to, Greg. Oh. 
So you didn't hear about Johnny's company going under and him wow. flying right back here to find out what was going on? Oh? Now he's piqued Vincent's interest. The success of Vincent's satellite caused a lot of investors to pull out of Johnny's company and they went under overnight. Well, that is music to Vincent's ears, I bet. But I think it's time to just move on from all of that and focus on Naomi. Vincent asks her on a date to the plaza, but of course, guess who decides to crash the party? Samantha and her loser ass husband, Johnny. When will we ever know peace? Vincent's trying to get them to just leave him and Naomi alone, but they're so bitter and sad that they just can't let it go. Great, Johnny lunged at Vincent and Naomi jumped Samantha? Oh! Oh, that is a down ass bitch. They both got their butts whooped and ran off, leaving Naomi and Vincent alone, finally. For good, hopefully. Naomi wants to just call it a night and make plans to come over the following day. Oh, she wants to see Vincent's satellite in the telescope. How sweet is that? She cares about his work and thinks that it's cool. I really think these two are just such a great pair. And Vincent thinks so too, because he decides to ask her to move in. Damn, that's a lot of money for a barista. But yay, finally, Vincent's luck is turning around. And he found a good partner with a good heart. What the fuck? Was that? Was that Vincent's satellite? Oh, please, Grim Reaper, spare her life. Otherwise, this would just be so, so awful. Your request intrigues me, mortal. I will give you what you ask, but on one condition. I will return Naomi to you, but you will forfeit all your earthly belongings. You must value her more than your own worth. So do we have a deal? Heck yeah, we have a deal. Vincent and Naomi are endgame to me. And that concludes Vincent's story. We can now play free play in Bitville and place Naomi and Vincent onto a new lot to start a new life, if we so please. I'm more interested in showing off the detailed story mode of these games, but I will say the free play mode is pretty legit. Two neighborhoods and laptop friendly? You gotta be kidding me. Speaking of kittens, it's time to dive into the next game of the series, The Sims Pet Stories. This one includes features from The Sims 2 Pets expansion pack and has two story modes to choose from, as well as a free play mode, of course. Both story modes in this one have 12 chapters as well. Best in show comes unlocked already, so we'll start here. Alice Witt has inherited her grandparents' house. Recently, she moved back to Garden Heights to take ownership of the property, but money problems have put her on the verge of financial ruin. A starving artist, she hasn't been able to make ends meet every month, but she's determined to make a better life for herself and her dog, Sam. She may be forced to move if she doesn't come up with the simoleons to pay her taxes. Her friends, Amaya and Thomas, are there to help but ultimately Alice must find a way to save her house. This fucking dog, man. I'm not much of a dog person. I'm a cat lady. So this type of shit really pisses me off. Sam's kind of cool though. You know, I could put aside my biases for this one. Oh, is someone at the door? Friends? Mm, maybe not. Can I help you? No, dear, we are here to see how much work this house will need once I undoubtedly own it. Haven't you heard you owe the bank 120,000 simoleons and I have purchased the deed in case you can't pay. I doubt you'll be able to pay the full amount, so I will be the new owner. Um, excuse me? Oh, well, you know, maybe she's right. Alice is kind of broke. Diana DeBoer and her cronies here need to get out of Alice's house. It's still hers, you know. I'm not going anywhere, you degenerate. This property is practically mine. Why don't you and your filthy mongrel start packing up all your things? I'm not gonna let Alice lose her house, okay? We have to come up with a way to get that many. Alice decides to sleep on it while Sam drinks out of his own piss puddle. Real useful, that guy. Alice is unemployed, you know, the whole starving artist thing. So I'm not really sure how she's gonna make that money. The newspaper. We should check the newspaper. Not for jobs, apparently, but Alice sees an ad for a dog competition. That would apparently award enough simoleons to save the house. I question that realistically, like, come on. But hey, if this storyline says it's gonna work, then I'll suspend my disbelief. Let's go to the park and register Sam for the competition. Before you register, we must verify that your dog can compete a basic run through the A-frame here. We can't let every mutt register for this event, you know? Ah, shoot, that doesn't look great. Hey, this man is laughing at us. But who is this other mysterious man, Brock, and what's all this whispering about? 
Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Witt, there's been a sort of misunderstanding. Please come forward and register. Not sure what words were exchanged, but thank you, mysterious man. I think he was one of Diana DeBoer's cronies from earlier. Well, let's go scope out the competition. Permission to speak denied, civilian. You can't psych us out. Show her your war face, meat. <laughs> I love that his name's Meat. Yeah, I don't think any of these competitors are gonna give us much trouble. We end up going home and inviting our friend Amaya over, and she brings Thomas, some other guy. Apparently, they're all friends. Alice catches them up to speed on her situation and her plan to get the money when Amaya runs off to go get something. She returns with an A-frame to train Sam with and tells us that Thomas apparently has a crush on Alice, but Alice insists she has enough on her plate. Thomas does ask to schedule a doggy play date tomorrow, though, and Alice says, ends up accepting. However, it's training time. We gotta get Sam's skills up. He is such a naughty dog though. This is gonna be a lot of work, I'm afraid. Oh great, now the sink's busted and the repairmen don't have time to come out. Well, Thomas came by, Alice asks him for help and like a true gentleman, he gets that sink fixed up real quick and even mops up the puddle. Afterwards, Thomas's dog and Sam have a little play date and he gives us a new dog training contraption. That was nice. Maybe Thomas is the kind of person Alice can end up with. Alice needs to visit the store for a dog training magazine and whose sign is plastered all over it? None other than Diana DeBoer. Does she own everything around here? Whatever. Let's get that magazine and get out of here. Oh, Thomas is here too. Are you hungry? I haven't eaten anything yet and I'm starving. I could eat. All right. This has turned into a whole thing now. We send Alice and Thomas over to the diner where they share a meal and he gives her a chew toy for Sam. I should really get going. I have a few things to do at home before I go to work. My boss doesn't tolerate me being late. He is such a nice guy. Oh God, Alice was out for such a long time. She's worried that Sam might have torn up the house. No, Sam peed and chewed up the furniture. Bad dog. <sighs> Better get this cleaned up. You need to start acting like a good little show dog if you wanna be a show dog, Sam. If we wanna get him behaving better, Alice is gonna have to put work into this as well. Thomas dropped by again the next day with yet another dog gift, a high jump to train Sam on. Remember, Alice, don't tell anyone where you're getting this stuff, okay? Interesting. I can keep a secret. Don't know why, but I'm fine accepting a little help here. All right, Sam, let's get trained up. First, we're mastering the A-frame, then the seesaw, now the high jump. Oh, what a good boy. Our first dog show is the very next day, and of course, Sam has to go get all dirty. Better bathe him and hurry on over to the competition. Once we're checked in, Alice and Sam wait patiently for it to be their turn to compete. Alice is wondering where Thomas is. You know, she was under the impression that he would be here to support her and Sam. She calls, but ends up getting his answering machine. If this is Alice, good luck. Aw, that's nice. We better just carry on without him. We made pretty good time, honestly. I'm sure that we could have done better. I could have clicked fast or whatever, but Sam did all right. Hopefully it's enough to get us through this round of the competition. Oh great, what is she doing here? Of course Diana DeBoer comes to steal my thunder and my money. Her and her stupid poodle. Right at the end though, her dumbass dog, Precious, fumbles the bag a little bit and doesn't finish as quick as she should have. Maybe that's a good sign. Alice, what? What are you doing? You're gonna get us disqualified. Oh God, this is mayhem. A dog fight and a cat fight. The judge didn't see us fight, apparently. He only saw the dogs, so crisis averted, I suppose. But even after all of that, Diana DeBoer won this competition. But since the other contestants have been disqualified due to the dog fight, Sam will proceed to the SimCity finals alongside Diana and her dog. I didn't realize we sucked that badly, but thankfully, we're able to squeeze into the finals. Well, young lady, I guess you'll be losing that house to me after all. There is absolutely no way you're pitiful little rag of a dog will beat my precious. Don't bet on it, Diana. We're gonna be the best in show at the finals, and I will keep my house. We will see, dear. By the way, I've decided to fire your friend, Thomas. I know what he's been doing for you, and I find it absolutely unacceptable. I suppose I'll be evicting him as well. Perhaps you can live on the street together. What a witch. It's also news to me that Thomas worked for Diana. Is there some sort of conspiracy going on here? Why would he help me so much with this competition if he knew she was going to compete too. That night, a quote, 
old guy was hanging out in Alice's front yard. There's no old people in this game, so that's funny. But Alice goes to greet him, and I guess he's some sort of dog whisperer, Caesar Milan type. He's very spiritually connected with his dog and wants to show Alice how to do that with Sam. And so the mysterious old man teaches Alice the way of the paw, and she is now more connected with Sam than ever before. The man gives her a paw statue and leaves. How strange. Maybe this will help us win in the finals. Alice is sleeping peacefully when the burglar alarm goes off. Sam, come here, boy. Where is that dog? Yeah, some guard dog, huh? Oh no. Where is Sam? The cops are too busy? Fucking great. My dog is missing. The only clue, a single stinky coffee cup from Cafe Grounds. Alice has to leave and go investigate. She sees Brock is there and confronts him. Brock, what did you do with my dog, Sam? I don't know what you're talking about, lady. I thought this guy was cool, what the heck? Listen, I don't care why you took him, but I'm worried. Sam is probably very scared and I don't want anything bad to happen to him. All right, lady, I don't want anything bad to happen to that little dog. Reese has him back at the abandoned house. But be careful if you go there because Reese is a mean one. Oh, I'm gonna go give Reese a piece of my mind. We arrive at the abandoned house and confront Reese and he dares shove Alice. Oh, thank God, Thomas is here to help. They get into it and Reese runs away with his tail between his legs. Sam is saved. And we know now that Diana DeBoer had to have something to do with this. Oh, there's a tire jump in my front yard with a note. I know this doesn't make up for losing your dog, but I hope that it will help you beat Diana, Brock. How funny. Thanks for the help, Brock. You should look for a new place of employment. Thomas comes bearing more gifts. Thanks for this new piece of training equipment. I thought you lost your job though. Let's just say I still have contacts inside. He ends up leaving and now my whole yard is littered with dog show training structures. Before we can get started on training though, Diana dares show her ugly mug. She is shocked to learn that Sam is home safe and sound and says that even if Sam beats Precious in the dog show and we win the money to buy the house back, she has no intention of even selling it back to Alice. She even has the nerve to steal our special paw statue. Sam, get her out of here. Turns out the paw was just symbolic and we never needed it to be a good dog trainer. That was within us all along. Wow. This story is just wild. We just need to look within ourselves to fulfill our destiny. Thanks, mysterious old man, Otis. You're kind of bizarre, but I get the message. That night, there was a package on my doorstep, the final piece of dog training equipment that we need. It's time to master all of these obstacles. We're gonna need to be perfect in order to win the SimCity finals tomorrow. Alice arrives and wow, this is intimidating, <laughs> but all that work is gonna pay off. We sit through the first duo, they do all right. They got a little over 1,200 points. We should be able to beat that, right? Amaya's here to cheer us on. I wonder if Thomas will show up, but look who's here, Diana DeBoer. She says as long as she's around, Thomas will never find another home in this town. What is her problem? <laughs> Now she's threatening to steal Amaya's house. This can't be legal, right? Why does she have so much power around here? It's time for Alice and Sam to compete. Sam's doing super well, going through each obstacle with no problems at all. We get to the end with a final score of 1638, at least beating the previous competitors. We'll just have to hope it's good enough to beat Diana. Oh no, her dog is amazing. Her dog is doing trick shots? Shit, guess we'll have to say bye to the house. Alice was ready to admit defeat when Precious fell off the seesaw. Oh no! I mean, yes! <laughs> They've been disqualified! That means Sam and Alice won the competition! And 120,000 simoleons? Jesus Christ! <laughs> Thomas and the cops are here? To arrest Diana! She's arrested for extortion, conspiracy, embezzlement, and dog napping. See, I knew there was something weird about her. Good riddance, lady. Thomas is back, Alice has enough money to pay off the house, and the day is saved. All thanks to little Sam. Amaya and Thomas come over for dinner, and Thomas's dog gives birth to puppies? What the hell? <laughs> now we just have two random little puppies hanging around. Apparently they're Sam's. I don't know when they had time to do all of that. But that's the end of Alice's story. I tried to have Alice and Thomas end up together after the fact, but they actually have zero chemistry and she is totally repulsed by him. So that didn't work out at all, but we'll keep the puppies. 
Our next story is with Stephen Loyal, an accomplished SimCity chef who leads a quiet and ordered life in the desert suburb of Mesa Flats. Lately, he's been unusually busy getting ready for his cousin's wedding and helping his employer Julianne cater the annual Mesa Flats Midnight Masquerade Ball. Little does Stephen know his life is about to get turned upside down. His boss, Julianne, wants Stephen to make the salad and lobster thermidor for the Midnight Masquerade Ball. What an honor. And the ice sculpture? Jeez, this is such an opportunity for Stephen. He's so distracted that he forgets all about his cousin's wedding. That's happening right now. His cop buddy comes over to tell him about a con man and missing persons case he's working on, and then is like, yeah, you're missing your cousin's wedding, so he quickly gets ready in order to make it on time. Oh no, Stephen missed the ceremony. Celeste, I lost track of time. I'm really, really sorry. It's no wonder you aren't married yet, Stephen. Ouch. No worries, though. Steven joins his cop buddy, James, at the buffet table. Hey, James, who's that guy over there? I haven't seen him before. That guy with the lantern jaw? That's Gordon Fletching. He's just moved into town, so kiss the ladies goodbye. Steven decides to introduce himself to Gordon. Ah, Celeste's late cousin, Steven. Late cousin? Sorry, friend, that was just a little joke. Excuse me. Well, he's a real charmer. Steven's got his sights set somewhere else, though. A lady on the dance floor named Rachel who's already dating Gordon. Damn. Celeste's friend Erin can't watch her cat Diva while she's on her honeymoon, so she asks Steven if he can do it instead. He's worried that it'll distract him from his work, but ends up agreeing to do it anyway. Erin brings over the cat after work the next day. She's kind of cute, Steven thinks, so, you know, he invited her in for coffee. Steven, you should keep an eye on Diva. Ah, oh, man, Diva. Stop scratching up the couch. This guy has no idea what he's in for. Cats do what they want, Steven. Get ready to have your house totally taken over. See? Cat on the counter. Poor Diva doesn't have anywhere to go potty, so she's going inside the house. Steven has to go visit the pet store and buy a litter box. And Gordon shows up to steal all the ladies, of course. Oh gosh, is that Diva? <laughs> Unbelievable. Who owns this mangy fur bag? Her name is Diva, and I think she's adorable. Way to go, Diva. Listen, just keep that thing away from me. While you're at it, stay away from Rachel. I saw you gawking at her. She's mine. Ah, uh, Steven's already forgotten all about his work responsibilities. That darn cat taking up all his time. Celeste sent over a cat condo to help keep Diva distracted, but it turns out Stephen's just kind of a procrastinator. He wants to work out so that he can compete with Gordon in the dating scene. And that night, he ends up calling Rachel, who's on a date with Gordon, and invites her out anyways. She's like, yeah, sure, they can meet at the club after. They're having a good time, it seems, getting to know each other and dancing. So Stephen, have you thought about who you'll ask to the Midnight Masquerade? Oh, great, Gordon here to interrupt our night. Gordon, have you met Steven? We've met. Rachel, I've been thinking about your proposal from the other night, and I'd like to discuss it with you right away. And then he steals her away. It kind of sounded like she wanted Steven to ask her to the masquerade ball, so maybe there's still a chance. What the heck is going on here? Diva, what are you doing, girl? Ugh. Okay, we gotta go get her. Hey, get out of my house, dog, and stop eating my couch. Oh, it's Aaron's dog. Whoops. She's cool with it though, and Steven decides to ask her out on a date. Maybe since Rachel's preoccupied with Gordon, he can keep his options open, you know? Uh-oh, my stomach is acting up. Steven's date is vomiting in the hallway. <laughs> now the whole restaurant is sick. It must be something in the water, Aaron suspects. That was kind of random, um, because they just decided to completely move on from that and take a photo in the photo booth. And that's the end of their date. Julianne is gonna be here today to pick up the first course for the masquerade. Steven needs to get to work. He prepares a beautiful salad and waits for Julianne to come pick it up. Diva! Diva, no! Diva ate the salad! What the fuck? Julianne's coming back later tonight to get the salad, but Steven's out of groceries now. That damn cat. Oh, Aaron's at the store too. Are you feeling any better today? I am. I was worried about you, so I took some of my special soup over to your place. Oh, that's so nice of her. What the heck? Diva, did you follow Steven here? Aw, Aaron thinks that she really likes Steven and salad. Steven really likes Aaron and decides to ask her to be his date to the ball. I'd have loved to go with you, Steven. It's just that Gordon already asked me this morning. 
What? I thought he was with Rachel. What a scumbag. Oh well, there's a more pressing issue at hand. Steven has some of Rachel's soup and quickly prepares the salad for the ball. Don't you dare eat this one, Diva. Now it's time to move on to the lobster thermidor. Julianne is pleased oh, with this dish too. Man. Diva was so good. She didn't even try to eat the lobster. Now that Steven's got a little bit of free time, he decides to invite his cop buddy James over. James is pretty bothered by Diva's presence though, not a cat guy, and wants to meet at the bar instead. Okay, fine. So the news is that the police in Arbor Falls have determined the con man's last name starts with S. That means Gordon Fletching can't be our guy. Steven's upset that Gordon is taking Aaron to the masquerade, but remembers his connection with Rachel. He's like, man, what should I do? When Rachel walks in, she smokes them at a card game and Steven's just, you know, smitten again. While she's in the bathroom, in runs Gordon, who confronts Steven about talking to Rachel. You can't have two chicks, dude. That's just greedy. Ah, shoot. Steven's got his ass whooped and James gets jumped too. Too. Don't you know that that guy's a cop? <laughs> Rachel's like, what the fuck? And Gordon has the nerve to ask her to the masquerade. Luckily, Rachel says no, that she'll actually be attending with Steven. What a surprise. Turns out she was hoping that he would ask her. Finally, Steven's got his date. The next day, Rachel invites him out to the club again, but Steven's really got to work on this ice sculpture. He's being bad though, and decides to go with her anyways. And naturally, Gordon's there to cause trouble. They're trying to avoid him, but he still tries to come over and flirt with her. What a weirdo. Steven decides to kiss her to show that they're together, but unfortunately, Aaron sees them. What does she care though? She's going to the ball with Gordon. Steven's so fucking dumb. Oh my God. Are you and Rachel dating now? Well, we, uh, Gordon just sort of? Really, dude? Sort of? Rachel's pissed, rightfully so, and leaves. How humiliating. Steven's aspiration the next day is to call Aaron and try for a do-over? Maybe Gordon's not the only scumbag in this story after all. I can't believe this. He's inviting her out on a date. Steven's close to the restaurant owner and introduces him to Aaron. This beautiful young lady would be a wonderful wife, don't you think? Oh my god. This makes me sick. What about poor Rachel, huh? You feel like home to me, Stephen, but I think that you and I are at different places in our lives. Aaron, Gordon is a no good, lying, two timing. What does that make you, Stephen? She doesn't like this confrontation and decides to leave. Good for her. Rachel seems to have cooled off and invites Stephen to pick out a mask for the ball. So it seems like they're still on, lucky him. And then he decides to buy Aaron flowers, red roses. I cannot believe this man. Now this is where I'm even more confused about the story. James is here and implies that Gordon's the actual con man, but it's not confirmed until we know his real name. I guess he's after Aaron and Rachel, not just romantically, monetarily, whatever. It's time to make the ice sculpture for the ball and have our boss pick it up. Steven tries to devise a plan to take down Gordon, and now it's time for the midnight masquerade. Our boss is very happy with Steven's work on the dishes and ice sculpture for the ball. That's one thing he's got going for him. Gordon's slated to perform some music. Cool. He should be preoccupied with that, but he's got the time to come over and flirt with Rachel. She agrees to dance with him, and Steven says hi to Aaron. I wish this whole situation wasn't so complicated. I like spending time with both of these girls, but that fraud Gordon has made me look like the jerk. You know what? No comment. Gordon takes off his costume when he takes the stage, okay? So Steven runs and puts it on in order to fool his henchman. The henchman falls for it and reveals their plan to steal both Aaron and Rachel's simoleons. And that Gordon's real name is Gordon Schnickel. James has to know about this. Gordon is declared the king of the Midnight Masquerade, but James puts a stop to the whole thing and goes to arrest Gordon. Oh no! The henchman's getting away! Get him, diva! Get him, diva. Yeah, that's right. Jail for the both of yous. Diva saved the day. And now Steven gets to pick who he wants to be with, Aaron or Rachel. I don't think he deserves either of them, but I guess he'll go with Rachel. And they even get to move in together, ending Steven's story. I guess Steven gets to keep the cat? So after completing both of these story modes, we can continue playing with these Sims in either Mesa Flats or Garden Heights, but we still have one more Sims Stories game to play.
Now, The Sims 2 Castaway, I mean, you know, they set the bar pretty high. I'm a castaway lover. The Sims Castaway stories, I will say, is wildly different. Gameplay-wise, it's much more aligned with The Sims 2 than the console version. Both games have similar concepts, with Sims being cast away on a deserted island, but very different stories. They were released only three months apart, so I mean, I'm assuming that they were getting developed at the same time by totally different teams. I, that's a pretty fair assumption as were all of these games probably. But Castaway Stories, if it wasn't different enough, is special. They got one big, huge story mode with 24 chapters, and then one free play mode to start. Shipwrecked and single. Sailing the world on the crew of a luxury yacht has been rewarding, but lonely. Could that be about to change? The captain just announced that the ship is heading for shore leave at Meet Your Mate, the hottest singles resort in the world. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to meet the love of your life. We can choose between between these two characters or create our own for this story. Let's go with Jessica. A storm is raging. It's absolute mayhem on board. When the boat sinks and leaves Jessica cast away, she wakes up two days later on a mysterious shore. Uh, what happened? That looks like my cruise ship. Jessica wonders if the others made it, but immediately kicks into survival mode. She finds a hatchet and a steamer trunk washed ashore and digs it out, which we place on the beach using the build by mode. Jessica's got some good instincts. She finds a way to quench her thirst and gathers coconuts for later. In this game, we we don't use simoleons as currency, but rather resources and food, the levels of which are indicated on the bottom left. We can use resources to purchase items and build buy, or just buy mode and story mode, we don't get to build. So instead of crafting like in the other castaway game, we can just buy a fire pit and place it on the lot. It's about to rain, we need to build Jessica a shelter quickly. That was a pretty good first day, I would say. Oh no, what's going on? Monkeys? No, the monkeys are stealing our stuff. Those are my coconuts. They made a total mess, those bastards. Never mind that for now, Jessica needs to go for a swim to replenish the hygiene need and learn how to fish. She can't just live off coconuts forever. Jessica notices this very convenient pile of wood and determines that she can use it to craft a raft. But she's gonna need more supplies. More logs, of course, but also something to tie them all together. Maybe she can find something in the jungle. Ah, can't cut these with our hatchet, apparently. We'll need to find a machete. Oh look! Found a machete. Okay, into the brush we go. A mysterious plane crash. Looks pretty old. Jessica finds a map in the wreckage, which we can now use to fast travel to locations we've visited before. The next area is where those monkey thieves live, along with a mysterious idol. The monkeys attack Jessica for trying to take it, but they're easily bribed with bananas. They're kind of my friends now, even. Jessica places the idol back at her camp and goes full on nutso. This idol is now her very own Wilson. Spalding, mind if I call you Spalding? Good. This could be a start of a beautiful friendship. Very funny. Upon further examination, she notices that the idol is missing a jewel. Oh, you wanna know what I do for a living? Uh, well, I guess you could say that I'm uh, self-employed, yeah. You call me a liar. You can't just throw out words like lazy and clinging onto the false hope of rescue. I'm trying. We really need to come up with a plan to get home. In the meantime, we can pick a job for Jessica to go do for a couple hours each day. When she comes home, she'll have collected a certain amount of resources and food and can even get promoted. We can also enlist monkey to be a part of our household, kind of like pets. And they can get jobs too, make themselves useful. They mostly just hang around the camp and do bullshit though. Jessica needs to find bindings for her raft. She searched the plane ruins again, but instead of finding rope, she finds Spalding's missing gem. In comparison to the console version of Castaways, there's not a ton to interact with in the environment. In that game, you could click on every tree and gather a crafting resource, but this one is much more simplified. So we have Jessica gather food before going home to replace Spalding's jewel. Uh-oh. Jessica is now sick with a mysterious disease. Maybe she shouldn't have messed with this idol. And lightning split apart a tree. I think the island is trying to tell us something. It did unlock a new area, however. One with a house. Shady Lagoon looks like a fabulous place to set up camp. There's even a medical kit. Perfect. Jessica's illness is cured. I wonder who built this structure in the first place. There were ropes inside of the house. Great, these will definitely work for Jessica's raft. We still need a few more parts before we can set sail though. For now, we can move on over to the Shady Lagoon. This 
place is more like it. Jessica decides to take Spalding out to explore some new areas of the island and finds the ruins of a shrine. She places Spalding on the ruins and it opens up a new passageway. Looks like this is where you belong, Spalding. It's been fun, except for when you tried to kill me. Oh great, more survivors. We finally found some people. Oh, they think they've been saved. Ooh, sorry guys. I don't have food or video games or a cell phone or a helicopter. They are survivors from the same wreck and have been getting food from an elderly gentleman. They haven't even been getting their own food. The coconuts in the tree are apparently too high up. They haven't started building a raft because it seems like a lot of work. These people are hopeless. Do you think Robbie has a girlfriend? I don't care, girl. Hugh thinks he's the one in charge. Yeah, right, buddy. I better find this elderly gentleman that's been taking care of these lost causes. Professor Reinhardt, you know, he probably knows what's really going on here. Jessica runs past a couple of hyenas in the swamp and finds the professor in the boneyard. He's interested in the raft that Jessica started building and tells us that we can find a good wooden pole in the crossroads near the village, you know, for a mast. How do you know so much about the island? I've made a study of the natives of these islands and their customs for years. Interesting. So he was already here or was he on the boat? Before heading off to the crossroads, Jessica picks up a bone just in case. Oh great. The plan is to steal a wooden pole from the natives of the island. Sounds like a great fucking idea. This cheetah or jaguar or whatever doesn't really seem to care about what I'm doing, but I'm more concerned about this mysterious professor. Jessica thinks he's kind of creepy. Look at that mast. Ew, what the hell? Get away from me. Ugh, he's being sort of helpful though. You know, maybe he can tell me where to get a sail for my mast. Jessica decides to invite him over to the lagoon for dinner. Oh, perfect. The freeloaders have taken over my home. It's not technically my home, but Jessica was here first, damn it. The professor points out that we may need their help later. Just don't tell them about the raft. <sighs> Fine, they can stay. They should at least have the decency to clean up after themselves though. The professor thinks I can weave a sail out of grass. Jessica's harvesting some grass out in scavenger fields when a little girl runs past. She's being chased by hyenas. Jessica throws the bone, quick thinking girl, and saves the day. The little girl is Nanihi, daughter of the chief. She's inviting Jessica to the village where outsiders are not typically welcome, but the chief will surely want to thank Jessica for her good deed. All she did was throw a bone. Now Jessica gets to meet people in the village and has to befriend all of them before getting to meet the chief. They'll also give her gifts and little quests, which I didn't realize until I had befriended my fourth villager. Your friendship with them increases faster if you do their quests. They have a pretty banging setup over here too. There's workout machines and everything. They basically took all the items from The Sims 2 and gave them a jungle theme. I, I love it. Jessica first gets to meet Nanihi's mom before meeting the chief. Why would anybody want to leave the island? That's what I'm saying. But Jessica misses her home, which is understandable. Nanihi's mom offers to weave Jessica a sail. How nice is that? Jessica is taken to another part of the village, the harbor, where she gets to befriend four more villagers before finally meeting the chief. He invites Jessica to the volcano festival as an honored guest. How special is she? The chief gives her a shell phone. <laughs> Very cute. Jessica, it is a tradition that the honored guest of the festival choose a date. <gasps> Who is she gonna pick? She met a lot of cuties, but I decided to go with Akolo. He was the most romantic when they met previously. When the first chief died of old age, Tuku Tuzu went mad with grief. He spent every waking moment creating new potions. Tuzu wanted a potion that would cheat death itself. Instead, he became consumed by his greed and lust for power. The festival was a time of second chances, a time to witness the true power of the volcano, the tribe, and love. Several years ago, they invited outsiders to witness the festival. The next day, the shaman lost his power. Some say that the volcano took it back, others blame the outsiders. What happened to the outsiders? Oh, they're no longer with us. Okay, cool. Apparently it's all chill now though, the festival is more so about celebrating life and courting a mate. How perfect! That's just what Jessica's planning to do. The chief is so generous as to allow Jessica to live with the tribe, and Jessica ponders, you know, if she moves into the village, she may never leave. But she really should just move over there. 
the other castaways have fully taken over the lagoon. Is Hugh laughing? What a dick. I'm out of here. These guys suck. Hugh especially. The villagers gave Jessica the nicest house ever. <laughs> they even brought her raft over here for her. The sail is finished, but is she ready to leave? Well, not quite. Apparently she needs a rudder. The chief is happy to have one made if she will do him one small favor. Our old village was abandoned because of a curse. This curse took many lives, so we fled. In our haste, I left my sacred drum behind in a basket. Will you fetch it for me? The shaman has forbid anyone from the tribe from returning to the old village, so Jessica is perfect for the job since she's an outsider. Before she goes, we get to check out Jessica's sick ass house and get a good night's rest. Tomorrow's going to be a big day. The shaman's home, the creepy hollow is guarded, but they allow Jessica to pass. She's on official business. She asks the shaman if he will grant her permission to enter the old village. He said, yeah, sure. I have a jaguar guard in the area, but if I want to avoid the curse, I should return the stolen idol to the temple. I think I already did that, right? Oh, he wants me to bring the idol to him. No problem. We collected the idol, which was not where I left it because those monkeys stole it. And then we returned to the shaman to give the idol back. What the hell? <gasps> Jessica's a taken woman, shaman. Now to just pass the jaguar. Jessica can do this by giving her an herbal charm, which worked like a charm, and then she was permitted to enter the Forbidden Village. Wow, this place is a ghost town. Literally, because Jessica starts rummaging through baskets and sees ghosts. Death awaits us all, but he follows you. Oh, yeah. Pick up the mysterious urn. Great idea. She finds three ghosts and three urns and is prompted to return the urns to the graveyard nearby. The ghost thanks her for her help. Jessica retrieves the drum and returns it to the chief. And it's luau time, baby. Akolo's here. Jessica needs to prove herself to him by drinking volcano water, doing a little limbo, and walking across hot coals. You are truly the woman for me. Him and Jessica have their very first kiss that night. The chief declares Jessica a friend of the tribe, and his reminder of Jessica's eventual departure really upsets Akolo. The next day, she figures she better make it up to him, but apparently he's run into the jungle, very upset. No, he has the curse. The the chief warns Jessica that they should flee, but she promises that it's just an illness and even goes to kiss him to prove that it's chill, I guess. The volcano did not like that. The curse does not affect you. How could this be? I told you it's just a disease. I had it and cured it with medicine. Now I'm immune. The chief's like, okay, sick, give us the medicine. But Jessica had used it all on herself. She's thinking that she can take the raft back home and go get more, but that would take too long. A cola wouldn't last long enough for her return. She still has to at least try. Oh, professor's here. What the hell? It's raining fire. No, my raft. The sail's all burned up. It'll take forever to get a new sail woven and I've got to go now. I don't know if this helps you, but there was a research base here long ago. You may be able to find a replacement sail there. Are you fucking kidding? You've been sitting on this information the whole time, old man. What the hell? This would have been nice to know about a lot sooner. <sighs> Jessica grabs a parachute and attaches it to the raft. Time is running out. She's gotta go. What does the professor want now? The disease came from an idol which protected the temple. The cure must be inside the temple itself, but it's been sealed for a long time. Legend says that to open the temple, you need the staff of Tuzu, which is hidden in a petrified tree on Volcano Island. I hate this guy. How the hell does he know all this and why did he keep it from me? <laughs> Whatever, there is no time to explain. Jessica needs to set sail for Volcano Island. She starts exploring the island, looking for this mysterious staff that she only just found out about and finds it in the petrified forest. A rock slide is triggered when she tries to grab it. Now she has to find another way back. Dead Man's Cove. Oh. Literally. How long have you been here? What's your name? Pittman. I was chief engineer on the Solomon Queen. Okay, he's not dead, but pretty close to it. The professor doomed us all? What does that mean? He bribed me to get into the engine room, didn't think it would do any harm, but then the explosion and here we are? <gasps> Wait, what? Oh no, he died before I could get more information. He has to be talking about Professor Reinhardt though, right? <sighs> I wish I could plead for his life, but it's not an option. Never mind. We've got to get back to the island. The whole village is sick now. We have to hurry to the temple. Reinhardt's waiting for us there. Jessica confronts him, but he brushes it off. It doesn't change a thing. My theory that the temple contains a cure is still reasonable. Hand over the staff and we'll find out. What? 
He's not even certain that there's a cure? My god, this guy. I've been trying to get inside this temple ever since the Illuminati stationed me here years ago. After we crashed the volcano festival and witnessed the power of the House of Tuzu, the race to steal the staff was on. What a dick. Apparently he stole the staff and hid it, but was banished from the island before he could use it. And now he's back and has tricked me into doing all of his dirty work for him. Hand over the staff if you want your true love to survive. Heck no! I'm gonna open this temple myself. Of course that little weasel runs right in and drinks from the golden goblet. It really did work. He's younger now. I guess his plan was a pretty good one. <laughs> the shaman's here. You hold the power to judge him, Jessica. Point the staff at him and choose. I choose to banish him. He sucks real bad. Later, nerd. Now the village is cured of disease thanks to the power of the staff. And Akolo and Jessica are engaged. True love prevails. The other castaways decided to crash the party. They want to live over here on this side of the island. And the chief leaves the decision up to Jessica. Fuck no. These guys suck. Luckily, a helicopter comes to the rescue. Everyone is saved. Well, not everyone. You know, people work their entire lives in hopes of retiring to a place like this one day. I'm staying. Me too. I don't want to lose my tan or Robbie. Jessica decides to stay as well. She can start a new life here with her love. Their marriage is the end of Jessica's story. Or is it just the beginning? We can continue playing in the shipwrecked and single world, as it's now been converted to a traditional Sims 2 style world with lots and such. There is also another world to play, Wan Mami Island, but I'm capped out on Sims for a bit. I will say the free play mode is super interesting in this game in particular, with the whole resources, food, build, buy system and all. And some of these lots, public and residential, are pretty cool. 10 out of 10 recommend. These were really fun games. I didn't even mind that we were missing some features from The Sims 2, just because, you know, the story modes... That's riveting stuff. Again, highly recommend you go seek out these games and play them for yourselves, even if you just wanted to play some new Sims 2 neighborhoods. Good stuff. But if you're interested in the making of this video or anything else that I would have to say about it, uh, feel free to check out my blog on listthelast.com. It's kind of where I just practice my writing skills, but I also give a little bit more insight onto my video creation process. And you know what? I love having a website. Yeah, and that's possible with the help of today's sponsor, Squarespace. If you're a small business owner or a creative of any type, listen up. Having a professional, clean website is something that is so important to your potential clients and customers. It's the first impression that counts, and for a lot of small businesses, that first impression is online. Creating a website that looks good and works properly is an incredibly daunting task, but that's where Squarespace comes in. Squarespace has tons of templates to choose from with categories for many different types of websites. And it's incredibly easy to customize from there. Bloggers can find great templates. Artists and creatives that need online portfolios. Merchants looking to sell products online. Restaurants that need to display a menu. Heck, even put your wedding RSVPs on there to save yourself some hassle. Any type of business can thrive on a Squarespace website. For those wanting to sell product, they have tons of e-commerce tools, analytics tools, and use many third-party extensions that we know and love to help you better manage your business. Have your clients make appointments and send them invoices directly through Squarespace as well. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash list the last, or you can just use my code list the last, and you'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. <sighs> Guys, we're almost through all of the Sims spinoffs and Sims console games. I have, I think, two more videos planned. That's insane to me. I can't believe I've played so so much Sims. My goal throughout all of this has been to just show off the amazing things that The Sims created in the past that get overlooked nowadays. So yeah, this has been really cool. I'm really excited for my last two Sims spinoff videos. Oh my god. If there's any specific series that you would like to suggest that I move on to next, please feel free to leave them down below. I do have one in mind, actually two, um, and that's Harvest Moon and Rune Factory. In due time, in due time. It takes me a while, okay? Especially Especially games like those. Oh my god, you could play them for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. If you liked this video, you would probably like the video where I played The Sims Medieval. That is a banger game. Also, don't forget about my second channel. I do have a second channel that I'm posting more casual gaming content on. Feel free to check that out. I hope you're having a great day and you continue to do so, and I will see you in the next